church itself, it's a season of finding redemption. Good morning, church family. How are we doing? Come on, say hello. Come on, give me some feedback. You know, I want to make sure you guys are happy to be in church this morning. Hey, can we say hello to our TC family, our Framingham family, our online campus? Come on, give it up for everybody. What's going on, everybody over there? My wife is over in uh, the Tri-County campus. She's like, you know, there's only one pastor over there. And I'm like, honey, it's my son. You know, she's like, and so I could tell she was softening me up. And now I realize it's because she wants to see the grandkids. So come on, everybody. She's pretending she's being pastoral. So I'm calling you out, baby. I am calling you out. Framingham family, hey, uh, congratulations on a great Freedom Conference yesterday. We just had a lot of people there just getting really free and tons of people just introduced to some, you know, weight coming off. Amen. But it's good to be here, and I just want to welcome all our online viewers as well to our service. As you can tell, we're in a unique series uh, entitled Churchianity. Everybody say Churchianity. And uh, fundamentally, we've been dealing with the subject uh, that is difficult to talk about actually in church, and that's why the, the video in its intensity is uh, kind of intentional, because we're talking about not emotional abuse, not physical abuse, uh, not verbal abuse, not sexual abuse. We're talking about spiritual abuse. Can I have an amen? amen. And it's just relevant. Now, today I'm going to kind of, uh, you know, go a little deeper because, uh, you know, a lot of times we're pulling back the sheets on the church and just showing some of the weaknesses in it. But I want to today go into kind of where it all went wrong, okay? Can, can we get into that a little bit today? Like, and how we can fix it kind of at a root level, amen? First, let me read a scripture to you. Uh, this is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Are you with me? Amen. In fact, let's do this. Let's stand for the reading of the word. Come on, let's get off our comfort, our comfort zones. Let's get off our physical pillow. I'll let you figure out what I meant by that. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24 says, in response, everybody say response. response. That's kind of what I want to talk about today, like our response to God. But in response to all he has done for us. Amen. Let us outdo each other. Let's outdo each other. This is like a competition in the Bible. Let's outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. And this is about serving one another. And then let us not neglect our church meetings, as some people do. Let's not get judgmental here. But, uh, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day, by the way, that word day should be capitalized. I don't know if it is on the screen, but it should be capitalized. The day of his coming back again. It's talking about the return of Christ. How many know that he's coming back again? How many believe that out there? TC Framing, how many believe that out there, okay? Because if he's not coming back, we're wasting our time here this morning, amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would assist me, which you, you would also help those that are listening within the sound of my voice to hear the words of God and to uh, receive them. Your word says that wisdom from God is peaceable and easily entreated. I pray they just, it's not information, it's supernatural insight that goes into their spirits and it doesn't just inform them, it transforms us. Lord. We thank you for the power of the word of God. We thank you that we can be together as a church family. Thank you that we can gather uh, together. And we do this more and more as the day of the Lord approaches in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So, um, you know, my son opened this series uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he referenced a, a recent experience that he had, a new experience that he had going to the chiropractor. Now, chiropractors used to be seen like witch doctors back in the day, but now they're, now they're seen with a different form of respect. How many have been to a chiropractor before? Raise your hand. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, so uh, this, this, uh, this analogy that he gave I thought was pretty relevant. He learned, you know, from, from his experience there that there's this term called subluxation. And if you've been to the chiropractor, you've probably heard that term before. But basically, uh, you know, some of your vertebrae and your spine, you can have just a couple of them out of alignment and it affects the entire spine. And, and I just want to use that analogy because I believe that the church has had at times, and sometimes us individually, not a spine problem, but a spirit problem. And there's been, in, there's been in a sense, a spiritual subluxation, and we need to get realigned, kind of repositioned. We need a different perspective on things, a different view on things, so that we can be back in alignment as the church of Jesus Christ. Are you with me, everybody? So today I want to talk about our view of church 
Turn to your neighbor and say, what's your view of church? What's your view of church? Now, I think you always have to go back to the beginning. There's this term in um, seminary. I used to say cemetery, but in seminary <laughs> called the law of first mention. The law of first mention. If you were like, if we're going to be Bible scholars today, you, you kind of, to define a word, try to understand it, you sometimes have to go back to the beginning for its original use. And then every scripture after that supports the original or the first mention of that word. So if you're studying, for example, the first time the Sabbath is mentioned, it's mentioned early. And the first time it's mentioned, it refers to rest. And so therefore, the definition of the word is because of its first mention and the connection between those words and, the, and, and how it was described. And so the law of first mention applies also to principles, not just words, like you know, we're talking about like the church or how we, how we see the world or how we, how we um, make decisions about certain things. And one of the places that a lot of first mentions come up is in the second story of the Bible. The first story is creation. The second story is a story about two trees. Two trees. Everybody know the story of the two trees, okay? We have the, there's all these trees that God planted, and they were there for your benefit and for your blessing. But there were two trees uh, there, and one was known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other one was known as the tree of life. Now, those were literal trees, but those trees are also symbolic, okay? And, and this is the part I need you to kind of, this is more caught than taught this morning. So I want you to understand those trees are there. Yeah, they're real. And they, they really were there. And there's a garden there. But they also represent a little bit more to us. And so sometimes we get our best and worst view through a windshield that we're looking through. And we get our best and worst view on life through the two trees that we see first mentioned in the Bible. Everybody tracking so far, at least trying to? Okay, so Genesis 2.9, it mentions these two trees. I'm just going to highlight them quickly so you can see I'm not lying. It's in, it's in the Bible. Okay? The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, good for food. But in the middle, everybody say in the middle, in the center was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge, listen, of good and evil. A lot of times when we read that, we, we skip right by that and we think, no, it's just the tree of the knowledge of evil. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I'm going to get into that in just a couple minutes. But these two trees, it, it, they, they affect the way you see life, the, the way you make decisions, your worldview, your biblical worldview. Uh, everything that you experience, including the church, is affected by these two trees, because these two trees in this first story, in this first mention, uh, represent a choice that we all have. We have a choice which tree we will eat from. Adam and Eve made a mistake, and they ate from the wrong tree, and it had dire consequences that have affected not only them, but generations to come. We, as Christ followers, still have a similar choice. Which way will we live our life? Will we live it through reason or will we live it through revelation? Will we, will we live it through right and wrong or will we live it through relationship? That's what those two trees, they are not just literal trees. They are trees, they're symbols of how we do and how we live our life. Are you with me? Yes. Are you guys getting something out of this so far? TC, you there? Framingham, come on. I, for me, I'm just, I, sometimes I feel like I can hear you. TC, I, I'm leaning, I'm leaning in. Anyway, um, but, but your view of church, let me try to unpack this. Like some of you came today to church and you were all excited. You know, you're just pumped. You can't wait to go to church. You're going to get your Sunday best on, whatever that looks like. And, you know, you're, you're thinking the scriptures, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, like you get pumped when you go to church. All right. And I get that. There's a lot of people that are like that. You know, better is one day in your court than a thousand elsewhere. And you can just quote all those scriptures and you get all fired up. And then there's others. I can't believe it's Sunday again. Wow. It's already Sunday. Man, it comes quick. Hey, you know, I think I'll go to the later service today. I think I'll go to the 11. I think, well, it's almost 11. I think I'll watch online today, you know, and wow, I, we missed the online service that was before. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to take a nap. We can always watch it on YouTube. You know what I mean? It's going to come out later on, sooner or later. And, and, and some, even, some even go further. Some form new opinions about church, their view about church. Some form like, you know, God, know, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. No, he don't know your heart. He knows your feet. 
That's what I say. But anyway, that's not what God says. But, but some don't go to church at all anymore because of their experience at church. Church people are judgmental and critical. And, and I don't want to go to church because uh, I, don't want, I, don't want to, I don't want to be around hypocrites. I, I don't want to pretend to live this wrinkle-free life. You know, and, 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 and so I, I'm just going to step back from it. I don't even understand half the time. Two trees. What the heck is he talking about? You know, I don't get it. I, I don't get church. And so I'm not going to go to church. And uh, some people don't go to church because they don't. It's too much energy to fake it. There's a lot of that, right? Are you with me, everybody? And so, by the way, church, church should be a place where you're allowed to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. Can I have an amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, that's true, that's true, okay? So, whether positive or negative, outlooks on your uh, uh, church and why you go, let me just submit to you, right or wrong, I, I, uh, positive or negative, I think those reasons are not necessarily good reasons. They're not. In fact, a lot of times they can be good reasons, but that doesn't make them right reasons. And so, what I'm trying to say to you is, I want a deep debunk. That's what my dad used to always use that word, debunk. I want to debunk. I'm getting all these reminders. Get away. Birthdays and stuff coming up. I want to debunk. They're my kids, so I, 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 should, I just want to swipe them fast. No, I'm just kidding. They want to de I want to debunk wrong reasons, and I want to replace them with some of the right reasons, because a lot of the reasons that we have, listen, strong coming through, are lies of the devil. They're lies of the devil. And how you see church will affect a lot of the outcomes that we see in the church of Jesus Christ today. In other words, I'm going to talk about deconstructionism, which some of you don't know what that means, and I'll unpack that later but uh, in the coming weeks. But a lot of why that's happening, not just for people who go to church, but for pastors of the churches they're leading, is, is because of what I'm talking about today. So I wanted to get back into your view. I wanted to get where I think things start and tend, tend to go wrong. Here's my big idea. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's, what it's, here's my big idea. Whenever there is misuse, there will eventually be abuse. Where there, wherever there is misuse of something, there will eventually be abuse of that something, okay? And so whenever you have something that you're participating in for the wrong reason or using it for the wrong reason, you'll end up abusing it. Now listen, if you take it all the way out, you'll end up at a place where you actually stop using it too. Uh, what? Hold on. Just hang on. I'll, I'll make it make sense. Let me, let me use like a, a, a very simple a, a, a example. Like if you had a knife, a sir, let's just say a sharp knife, okay? I'm not talking like a butter knife. I'm talking about a sharp knife. Now a knife in one hand, depending on how that person sees it, has a different um, end point, end game to it, okay? So a knife can heal, a knife can hurt. A knife can heal, a knife can hurt. And when the implement is used right, you actually want to use it regularly. When it's used wrong, I would say to you, eventually you abuse it. Eventually you will, you will try to hide it and maybe stop using it. If you think about a knife, right? You use it for the wrong reasons. Eventually, you know what? I did something wrong with that. Uh, that didn't go well. And so now I'm not going to use it. Oh, I don't want anybody to find it to see what I did with it. So now I'm even going to, you don't understand? But on the other side of using it for the right reasons to heal and to help and to save lives like a surgeon would, you keep on using it. So a lot of times it has to, the misuse can become an abuse. And it kind of depends on how you see the knife in the first place. Another aspect of, uh, uh, of misuse isn't just about bad things. This is going back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I'm doing some application here. It's not just about the use of bad things. It's also about the use of good things. I don't get it. I don't understand. Let me say it like this. Too much good too fast can be bad. Too much good too fast can be bad. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, this is an example the Lord gave me a long, long time ago when we were transitioning our church. And that's too much to unpack this morning, but we, we weren't getting away from our moorings. We were adjusting some of our methods. The message is sacred. The methods are not. So I've never left my spiritual moorings and formations. My daddy taught me the Bible really well, really grateful. But we, we do church a little different now. Okay? What we had last Sunday in the service, that was all the time everywhere. Okay? 
You're like, whoa. <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, but here's an example. God, God gave me this analogy. He gave me, he gave me a picture of a camera. I'm not talking about your phone, everybody. Okay, I'm talking about the old school days when you had cameras. So I, I, uh, like a spiritual daughter in this room, she's really good with a camera. I just, you know, different people, but it's rare now. Now it's more an exception. It's more like it's like a special hobby for, you know, gifted people. But, but the camera back in the day, when you would take a picture, if you opened up the back of the camera prematurely, the film would get what? It would get ruined. It would get overexposed to too much light. Right. And so God basically said to me that film is like a human heart or the spiritual development of a person. If somebody gets too much light too fast, they're not able to develop. But the Bible says that God is light and in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, no shadows, no shifting shadows. It says in one translation, light is good. God is light. God is good. But too much light too fast is and can be bad, right? Because you're like, wait a second. Yeah, because God never wanted you to be overexposed and he didn't want you to have too much of a good thing before or if it was coming out of the wrong source or the wrong tree, all right? So let me, I hope you guys are starting to see this a little, a little bit at a time, okay? Now back to kind of this, this can happen parts and pieces with the church, this stuff comes in, and things can get mishandled, mis misused, and because of the, the misuse and the mishandling sometimes of, of leadership and, and people's authority, that we talked about spiritual abuses when a, a person of authority uses their charisma and authority to manipulate people to their preferences and not God's purposes. Right? That's what spiritual abuse fundamentally is. And so when people do that, uh, then, and it goes bad, people uh, make decisions and draw conclusions about that, about church and about church leadership and about church people, and they discard it. Now they don't want to have anything to do with it anymore because of that. And so we have to go back, in essence, to God's original design, where, where kind of things are first right. Not just first mentions, but things were done right. Because if we don't, we're going to see this constant negative connotation, connection with the negative about things that relate to the church of Jesus Christ, of which he uh, is a big fan of. The church of Jesus Christ is Jesus' bride, right? How many know Jesus is a big fan of the church? It's like, it's like you know, it's like, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Well, That'd be like you saying, I like you, Petey, but I don't like your wife. Them been fighting words in my house. You know what I mean? I think, you're, I think you're a great guy, but I don't know about her. Well, we got a problem then. You know, Jesus is, this, that's his plan A, and that's his priority is his bride. So what we have, so we don't throw the, the old adage, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's get some spiritual subluxation related to the church. Are you with me in our view? Number one, write this down. Here's three spiritual adjustments. Are you enjoying this so far? Yeah, baby. All right. Number one, my actions are my response. When it comes to the church, my actions are my response, my attendance, my prayer life, my pursuit of God, all of that stuff. It's, it's my response, but it should be my response to the goodness of God and what he has done and is doing in my life. It's not about somebody else. It's not about you. Okay, and so back to the garden where God establishes so much, he places Adam and Eve there. And while, while this is again back to first experiences or first mentions, while they're there, God says to them, hey, you guys, you guys can, you can basically do whatever you want. It's, it's all yours. Have a blast. We could talk about some of the awesome things that were uh, given to them in the garden. It's pretty amazing. But here, here's the, I was going to say rules, but here's the rule. There's one rule in the garden. And the one rule was you can't eat of this one tree. How many know that God gets a bad rap as a restrictive, you know, mad at us, bad cop, Almost like a, you know, he's policing behaviors. No, God established, thing in, established things for us in, in the, his original intent was, was freedom, not restriction. 
okay? In fact, in Genesis 2.16, it says the Lord God commanded the man. And he says, you are free. Everybody say free. free. Come on, say it loud. Say free. free. You are free to eat from any tree, like, in the garden, okay? I mean, that's, that's pretty sweet. And so I think this debunks the myth that God is a restrictive God. He's like, you're free. You're not bound. And by the way, sidebar. Sometimes we have to define freedom or understand it to appreciate it. There's no freedom without boundaries. You're free to drive. You get a 16-year-old the keys to the car. Okay, you're free. To, you, I don't have to be in the car with you anymore. You don't need, you know, a co-pilot anymore. But, but, there's not just one rule. There's a bunch of them. You got to stay in the lanes. You can't just go down any lane anytime you want. There's speed limits. There's, but you're free to go anywhere. And, and you appreciate that, right? You appreciate that because you know that those boundaries or those rules are there for your protection, not for your restriction. Are you with me, everybody? It's like there's no, the, the river, you know, and it, it's free flowing, but it has banks to it. Otherwise, otherwise it, it doesn't work right without boundaries, amen? And so God says you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I want you to be free. I want you to enjoy life. I want you to enjoy marriage. I want you to enjoy your kids. I want you to enjoy the land and all the things that are on it. But I don't, what he's saying is I don't want you to live your life from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. I don't want that tree to be your source for living. I think, I think you're being contemplative in here. That's why you're so quiet. Otherwise, I call this a Catholic church. But <laughs> he here's what most people think when they read that. They think that don't eat from the tree of evil, but again, it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Both the knowledge of good things can be bad for you, but not just the knowledge of bad things bad for you. And basically, God is just saying, I don't want this or that, good or bad, to be the why you live your life. Okay? And so God didn't want you to live from that reason realm. So why do you go to college? Why do you work so hard? Why do you get up so early? Pity because it's the good thing to do. God never intended it to be because it's the good thing for you to do. Why do you, why, why on the other side? Why, why do you cheat on your taxes? Or why don't you? Let's, let's stay there. Why don't you cheat on your taxes? That's, that's probably better, you know? Why don't you put your nieces and nephews on your taxes? You know, why don't you, why don't you claim them? You know, why, why, don't, why do you cheat? Why, why don't you? I gotta be careful. Why don't you cheat on your spouse? You, know, you go ahead. You know, get, why, well, you can get away with it. Nobody's gonna know. Why don't you watch porn? Nobody's gonna know. Because that's not the good thing to do. That's not the right thing to do. Can I just tell you something? That's not the source that God wanted you to live from in your life. That's what he's saying here in the beginning, and it's going to make sense more. In other words, watch this. He never want this is good or this is bad to be the motivation, operative word here, for your life because he knew the knowledge of good or the knowledge of bad would never be enough to keep you from trial, to keep you from temptation, to enable you and empower you to overcome the different tests in your life. That reason realm would never be enough. And so he, so he protected you from that, not restricted you from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Listen, listen, like, think about it like this. Just put this in your own world, your own realm. How many of you have, um, would agree that you haven't made a lot of good decisions up here? Right? In your head. In other words, if we did make a lot of good decisions up here in our head, then we'd have less debt. You know, we have less fights, we have less divorce, we would have less psycho girlfriends and boyfriends chasing us, okay? Right? Are you with me, everybody? Because if, if we could just live up there in our head doing the right thing or avoiding the bad thing, okay? The thing is, this, this, you know, you think about things like uh, you're in an argument with somebody. Has anybody ever been in an argument in here? Raise your hand if you've been in an argument before. Okay, okay, the rest of you lying, lying, lying. <laughs> Okay? But if you've been in an argument, you know that there's something will pop into your head and you'll have a conversation with yourself in your head and you'll say, I better not say that. I better not. I, I can't say that. Oh, I want to say that so bad, but I better. I'd really like to say that, but I'm not going to say that. And what do you do? You say it. <laughs> you say it anyway. Right? 
because you were not, I'm trying to get you to see, you were not designed by God to be intellectually motivated. Because, because you were not designed by God to be intellectually motivated to think, well, that's the right thing to do, and so I'll do it. No, you won't. And no, you haven't. If you've been living from that tree. <laughs> And I like to say, if you, if you think that's why, I would just say, how's it going? How's it going for you? Can you give, give me some play-by-play on how that's working out, you know? I might be able to show you some connections here for what's going on. So people who start for good reasons and then later fail, have we heard those stories before? Exercise programs, personal growth programs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and we just, we, we, and then sometimes we go like crazy, for the good reason, for the right reason. Like, I'm not going to eat ice cream. I, I did this, okay? I did this not too long. I'm not going to eat any ice cream. I go on vacation. I haven't eaten ice cream for the longest time because that's wrong. I don't want to do that. It's bad for me. It's bad for my body. I'm standing in the line. My whole family's getting ice cream. I'm at the back. I'm just, I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to stand here. And then they're like, Dad, you got to pay for it. I'm like, no! That means I have to get closer to the cashier and closer to the ice cream. And then I'm, get, and I'm getting out there and getting out there. She's like, sir, would you like any? Yes, I'll have some. <laughs> How much would you like? I'll take the banana split. <laughs> no, nah, not a scoop. I took a banana split. And then, and then the ice cream comes and, and, and I'm saying in my head, if not out loud, this is going to make me feel so bad. <laughs> but does it stop me from eating it? No, and don't look at me like you haven't done something very similar <laughs> or worse. And I was in a food coma after that for a long time, okay? So your intellect is insufficient to motivate you to change you. So let's play it out with church. Why, Why do we go to church? Because, because that's what Christians do, PD. We go to church because that's what Christians are supposed to do. How's that been working out in the last, you know, 10 years or so? with the decline of attendance in the church, okay? Oh, because I need something. You know, there's something I need. Or because I want to be built up. I want to be encouraged. Well, that's a good reason. Okay, fine, all right. But that's all up in here. That's all up in your head. God doesn't want you to live up in your head. So Romans 12.1, let me give you some more on this. This text helped me out. I saw, I've, I've read this verse a thousand times. This is another perspective that I saw. By the way, these two trees, these symbols, and these ways of looking at life are everywhere in the Bible. Listen to me. Listen carefully as your pastor. If you will ask the Holy Spirit to help you, he will show you how to live in the tree of life. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you, and he will show you all kinds of places in the Bible where it shows up. But here's another one, and I'm going to show you a couple more before we leave. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul's saying... Listen up, brothers and sisters, in view, you might want to circle, underline that word, either in your conscience or in your Bible, in view of God's mercy, what do you do? You offer your body a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your reasonable service or your true and proper worship. So the main motivation in life can't be because it's right, it's wrong, don't do this, don't do that. Excuse me, can somebody get me a little drink of water? It must, it must be that you experience life itself. The tree of life represents Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbors and say, the tree of life is about Jesus. All right, we're going to take a praise break. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing like drinking publicly. Amen. <clears throat> All right. I don't know what happened there. But the tree of life is referencing your relationship. A, a relationship, a revelation experience with you and God, not reason, not knowledge. Are you with me, everybody? So whatever you do, just do it, but do it out of your love for God. And let me say it like this. This, this verse is basically saying the right way to do it is to have a view or perspective of his mercy on your life. You, you look at whatever's going to happen here through, in a sense, the window of, oh my gosh, what has he done for me already? In view of God's mercy. 
And if you, if you know your Bibles, there's a lot of reason to be thankful for that. You know, I have three, three grandsons now. And um, I hope to have a granddaughter in the name of Jesus at some point. But, um, but I have three grandsons. And my youngest, the, the newest, you know, uh, tyke on, in the territory, the new kid on the block, is my grandson Ezra, Ezra James. And he is a trip. I love this kid so much. He's super physical. He's, he nuzzles, like to get up off the ground, he'll use his head, you know, sometimes to get up off the ground. Everything's with his head. Nuzzles his head into your body. Nuzzles his head into your neck. Uh, he's very affectionate, but he's also, he can be rough too. You know, he, he likes to smack you around a little bit, you know, and, and I love it. I love it, you know. So I, I'm bad training for him with girls because I like all the physical contact. That's my love language. I don't care if it's, you know, a, you know, rough. But, but one of the things I love about Ezra is recently he likes to play hide and seek. And so just thinks it's the greatest thing. You know, it's the oldest game in the book, but he thinks it's brand new. Nobody's ever discovered this before. <laughs> Poppy's going to think this is amazing. And so he'll go around the couch and he hide. Where's Ezra? I don't know where Ezra is. And then he comes back around and he just, the biggest grin in the world. And he just starts laughing. I'm like, oh, there he is. And it seems like we'll do that a hundred times. And then I just finally get tired. I guess I, I just do not want to play this dumb game any longer. Like, there's just, is there anything else you got? Like, is there any other games you want to do? And so, but then eventually, you know, he, he kind of, like, he'll vanish. He's, he's suddenly, you know, when, you know when it gets quiet? You know, think, you're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a little distracted. So suddenly, Ezra's not in my view anymore. And when he's not in my view, things start to go wrong very quickly. We have 34 stairs in my house. And before you know, I remember not too long ago, now he can, he can trek them easily. But, but not too long ago, he'd go up like 10, 11 stairs. The kid would be like at the top, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, oh my God. You know, like he could have just really hurt himself, okay, many, many times. And, and, and before you know it, you know, he's, now he's climbing chairs, getting on countertops in the kitchen, opening up things, throwing things all over the place. The ki- if he's not in your view, if you can't see him, if you can't hear him, there's going to be problems. He runs out into the street. That's what he was doing yesterday. Literally just Ezra, you know, and, and he's just crazy. But as long as he's in view of me, he's in my view, everything's okay. That's what Romans 12, 1 is saying to you and me. It's the same for us. As long as we are in view of God's mercy, his forgiveness, his grace, his kindness, then our motivation for loving him, following him, uh, for being in community, for going to church and be a part of a church, being Christ-like, is now from the right tree. Are you with me, everybody? Your motivation will change, and so will your results. This is huge. Here's another text. Let me give you another one. John chapter 14, verse 15 says this. This text changed my life. This, this text changed me as a pastor my whole life, this one text. Now, when I read this text to you, this text can be one of the, uh, the most painful, you know, texts you could ever read. One of the most impossible, high-pressure texts you could ever read if you read it wrong. But it says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Now, you have to pay attention to where the comma is in this, in this verse. But there's two trees right here in this verse. One tree is if you love me, do what I say. If you love me, prove it. If you love me, show me the money. If you love me, you wouldn't do that. You'd be like this. You'd be more like that. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it doesn't say that. See, the wrong way is I have to prove to God how much I love him by obeying him. And and, and that looks like, that looks like when you play it out, I want to cuss at you so bad, but I'm a Christian. <laughs> I can't. I want to speed. I feel the need for speed. <laughs> but there's a police officer right beside me. But I can't. I want to eat all of that ice cream right now, but I can't because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right? See, when you equate your love for God with obedience, then you eventually won't obey. 
You, you, you won't behave. But if you didn't see, if you didn't see it like that, if you saw it as, if you didn't see it as out of obedience, but you saw it out of relationship, everything begins to change. And as a result, when it's out of obedience and you don't do it because eventually you'll fail because of it, then you don't ask God anymore. God, I need healing. But I can't because I, I stopped tithing six months ago, so I can't ask God for healing. I, I can't ask God to open that door of favor and blessing because I drank too much last night. I can't because... Fill in the blank, fill in the blank, fill in the blank. See, we have this mindset that God responds primarily to our actions instead of our love. Mm -mm -mm. So the verse is saying, if you love me, you will. You will. You will obey me. You will obey my commands. The focus is on love, not the commands. The right way is I love him so much and I want to do what's right because of it. God is saying, you just focus on falling in love with me, not following me perfectly. You focus on falling in love with me, not trying to follow me perfectly. One is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and one is the tree of life. And suddenly, when you're from the tree of life, you want to forgive. You want to obey. You want to tithe. You want to go to church, everybody. You want to be in community because you've got it right. Your view has changed. Are you with me, everybody? John, 1 John 5, 3 says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. That's love for God. If you read it wrong, you love God, keep his commands. But then he says, and his commands, verse 3, are not burdensome. Here's a litmus test. If doing what God, if doing what God says is burdensome, you're in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, this is so good. I don't know if you get this. Whenever you're, whenever you're struggling with a motivation to do anything right for God, if you're struggling with your motivation to please God, to, to do what's right for God, it's a love issue. It's not a keeping the rule issue. It's a love issue. It's a love issue. And God knows that because he wants it to be from your heart. So, like, for example, just take tithing, for example. Like, he's not after 10%. He's actually after 100%. He just wants 10 of it to come back to him. That's the one rule in the garden for him. And the other 90, you get to do it under your management, but it's all his. It was all supposed to be from the heart. Are you with me, everybody? See, God knows if you're eating from the right tree, he doesn't get a part of you. He gets all of you. Thank you, Jesus. This is so good. All right. This is good, amen? All right. Number two, write this down. It'll be faster on these next two points. The first one was my big one. When second adjustment, chiropractic, spiritual subluxation problem, when new problems come, it helps me forget. Now, I think this applies to the modern church today when there's issues in it. When new problems come, if you have the right view, it helps you forget. See, over time, I think for some, church experience has changed from I've been so blessed. God's been so good to me. But because it morphed into the tree of knowledge or it started there, now it's more like, what have you done for me lately, God? I have a Janet Jackson song playing in my head right now, but I'm really trying not to do that. <laughs> restraint, restraint. I love you, God. Help me restrain myself. Um, when, 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 when my kids were younger, four kids, you know, when they were younger, I would go away on a trip, not as much as I do now, but I would go away and then I would bring gifts home to them often, not all the time, but often. And I would, I, I, there was nothing greater than coming home, daddy, you know, they go crazy. And we had this long hallway and they'd run down this whole hallway to try to capture me and catch me. And I couldn't decide, you know, whether I was going to try to hold them, hold the stuff that was in my hands, which one was more expensive or important. But, uh. <laughs> But anyway, um, <clears throat> that's how it was in the beginning. But then after a period of time, some things started to change. Then it started to be like, Daddy's home. I introduce myself now. Daddy's home. They're like, Daddy, hey, what's up? You know? And then they'd start looking at me from, the, from a distance, trying to just see, like, is there anything in his hands? Is there anything in his pockets? Anything behind him that he's carrying? Like, what's going on? And then, and, then, and then usually one of the girls would come up and be like, Daddy, what you got for me? You know, that's what Zion, my, my eldest grandson, says. Like, what, what you got for me? And then, you know, he always tries to give us gifts. What I got for you? 
And, but they, they always want to know, where, where's the gifts? And I'm like, Daddy doesn't have a gift right, right now with him. Like, you get me. I'm the gift. You know what I mean? And then they wouldn't say it initially, but you could almost like hear their thoughts. It's like, yeah, but uh, that's not quite what I was looking for, Poppy. I was looking for a little bit more than just you, you know? And, 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 and if their feelings could communicate like with words, they, I think they'd be like, well, you don't love me. You don't love me like you used to. You don't love me the same as you once did because you used to come home and you used to bring me gifts. Are you getting what I'm dropping here just a little bit right now? And so God is simply saying, I think, to us, I didn't bring you anything today but me. And me should be more than enough for you. And sometimes we conclude because of our original premise or definition or tree that we are ingesting life from that he doesn't love us anymore because he doesn't have those responses the way we like him to. And it affects our desire to be with him as a byproduct of which tree we're living in. Are you with me? I can't believe, you know, I can't believe he didn't have anything for me. It used to be, I can't believe he forgave me. I can't believe how much he loves me in spite of me. I can't believe I get to be in his family as a child of God. And and now it's changed, you know? Now it's like, Daddy, where's my breakthrough? Daddy, where's my open door? Daddy, where's my miracle? Where's my blessing? Where's my favor? Daddy, how come I tithe and I don't get an increase like they seem to be getting an increase? How come I pray and I still get sick? And how come I'm hospitable to other people, but other people aren't that way to me? And and church suddenly becomes what daddy does for us instead of what he already did. And this lie at the root of the tree affects our desire. Are you seeing this, everybody? And so we misunderstand And by the way, don't misunderstand this part. God does heal, and God does bring favor, and God does bring breakthrough, and God does answer prayer, and God does blesses us. But that's not the main point is what he's trying to get us to see as we're going. That's the frosting that you're being preoccupied with, but you've forgotten about the cake. The cake is the tree of life. But we've been a church that's all about the frosting. And when all we have is just a slice of frosting, you know what happens to a church that just eats frosting? It gets diabetes. <laughs> Spiritual diabetes, okay? Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his, uh, his love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Everybody say, while I was a sinner. While you were addicted to porn, while you had rage in your heart, while you were insecure and broken, while you were depressed, while you were jacked up, I loved you in that state is what he said. I gave my life for you jacked up. And now you're trying to follow me perfectly so you're no longer jacked up? That definition of perfect is filthy rags to me according to the word of God. Jesus. See, we're so preoccupied with solving all our earthly problems when Jesus already solved the biggest problem of all. And we forget that so easily. And if we had a view of that, and if we were living from the right tree, uh, we would forget a lot of the things that get us all upset. Because when you have the right view, you never lose. You always win. You always win. That's why Paul said to live as Christ, to die as gain. Because he had a view that was different. Are you with me, everybody? So I'm not going to sit up here today and expose the church without explaining the best way to stay healthy first. You got to make sure that you got your view right and that you're eating from the right tree. Amen? Okay, but pastor, you didn't talk about, you know, you talked about how I can love him right on Monday, on Tuesday. But why do I need to go to church, though, for that? Because I can just do that on my own. All right, ready? One more point. Last point. Everybody say last point. Number three, he promised to meet me here. He promised to meet me here. Now, Matthew 18, 19, it says this. I'm going to read two verses from this. The first verse deals with all the things that we want. He says, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth covering anything, everybody say anything, that they ask for, everybody say ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So you can ask God for stuff. 
Don't misinterpret. Ask. Ask big. One, trans- one, one verse in the Bible says, ask for the nations. So God's cool with that. You can ask big. In fact, some of you just don't ask big enough. But you don't ask first. You don't ask, you don't ask out of reason. You don't ask out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You ask out of the tree of life. That's why it says, because I just don't want you to, I want your motivation to be right. Are you with me, everybody? But the next verse gets it right. It helps us with our perspective. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, where, where else does that happen? Nowhere but the church of Jesus Christ do two or more people gather in the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I am there. Where is he? He's right here. I am there in the midst of them. Come on, everybody. I'm there. I meet him there. It's a promise. So I don't come to church for just what God can do for me. I come for his love for me. I come uh, because uh, of what he's already done for me. But I also come to see him and to meet him. And this is a part that I don't know that I can translate perfectly this morning, but let me, you can write this down. I think it's in the notes. He promised if we show up, he will show up. If we show up. But can I just say, can we show up right, though? Can we show up right? Let's show up from the right tree next Sunday. Let's show up, let's show up from the right tree the next time we go to small group. That we're not showing up for what you got today, PD. Start kicking out some jokes. <laughs> PD, what do you got? I need a new, I need a heavy revy. I need some more knowledge because I've learned a lot from you. And I, I, don't, I haven't heard anything new in a couple years. I've been here two, three, four years and I feel like you're recycling the same stuff. Which, by the way, I'm not. But, <laughs> but it's not about that. Are you with me, everybody? Yeah. What about the worship? You know what I mean? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of that song. That's not my favorite song. We got, we got to get out of that, right? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. That's right. Not just a person or a few people on a platform, everybody. And I just want to apologize. I apologize for in any way this communicates the priority. Because the priority is not the worship and how great it is. And the priority is not uh, the preaching and how eloquent and creative it is. The priority is Jesus Christ and him alone. And no one else, no one else will do in Jesus' name. Are you with me? And so I ask you, have you encountered him when you come to church? Because maybe you're not sometimes encountering him because of your view and how you see things. So I want you to stand to your feet. TC, Framingham, I want you to join me. We're going to have a joint ministry time together. In a couple of minutes, the worship teams at all locations are going to minister a song that I love personally. But before we can get intimate with God and encounter him in a personal way, maybe with a fresh perspective, somebody here, somewhere out there, somebody needs to be introduced. You can't be intimate with someone that you haven't actually been introduced to. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, all over the room and all locations everywhere, I just want to ask you this question. All campus pastors at all locations ready, paying attention to the room, every head bowed, every eye closed, honoring the person to your right or to your left. I don't know, did you meet religion or have you met and encountered and experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about going to church, sir, ma'am boy or girl. I'm not talking about joining church. I'm talking about joining in relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus changed my life and he can change yours. A lot of times people say, oh, you're, 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 what do you do? You're a pastor. I hate when I have to introduce myself by what I do because it's not about what I do. It's about who I know. I, I know I met this person. He's a person. And he, and he altered the course and trajectory of my life. And he can yours too. And maybe you met religion but not relationship. And if you're here today and you're not certain you've actually met Jesus Christ personally, all locations, I want you to say, Pastor, there's no doubt that he's speaking to me right now. Something's going on inside my heart. And as a sign that that's happening right now and you want me to pray with you, I want you to raise your hand good and high and say, that's me, Pastor, right now. Just put good and high. Wherever, where me and God and the campus pastors can see it. That's it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. Over there, I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. That's amazing. 
online, you do the same thing right there where you are in your home. Maybe that's you. you, you you've experienced religion way too long, but t- today is the day you experience relationship. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I feel like I'm talking to an individual, not just people in, in, in a crowd, in a church. I feel like I'm talking to an individual. You, you know that God's speaking to you. Just, just pray this prayer. And everybody, would you just join with this prayer as if they need some encouragement? Because you've done this before, some of you. Just join them. Just say, say this with me. Say, Jesus, today I want you in my life. I don't want to go another day following after religion. I don't want to live trying to be good, trying to avoid doing bad things. I want to live in relationship. I want to experience a revelation of who you are and how much you love me right now. I thank you for what you did for me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and you died on a cross to pay for those sins. And in this moment, I'm expressing my gratitude. And I decide today that there's going to be no one else ahead of you. You're going to be first in my life from this day forward in Jesus' name. Now, with every, every person in the room, just, just listen for a second. You know, I was thinking about this first Easter, I know we just went by that, but the first Sunday service, you really could say in a way, it wasn't it wasn't a church, it was in a garden. It was the Garden of Eden, but then there was the Garden Tomb. And interesting, there were these three women that went to the garden. They were headed that way to see Jesus' body. And this just came to me the other day that Jesus, they were going to see Jesus' body. Do you know that Jesus' body is the church. The church is referred to as the body of Christ. This is interesting. These three women, they go there, but two left and only one stayed. Only one stayed. Only one stayed in church when things didn't go quite the way they thought they were going to go. Where is he? He's not here. All there is is this cloth here and this. Where is he? He promised. And they were disillusioned. They were discouraged. They didn't come. The disciples didn't even go in the first place because they were so disappointed in Jesus. But this one woman went. And she's probably just, I don't know, I just can imagine her sitting there, Mary, just sitting there like, what's going on? Where's his body? Where is he? I'm confused. I'm disillusioned. I I expected something else. And I just want to say, whoever you are, wherever you are, you can go to church and you can come with your confusion. You can come with your unmet expectations. You can even be angry and disappointed. God can handle it. But don't, don't decide not to come with that. Come with all of that. Come to the body. And this woman was right there. And in the middle of that, somebody called out, Mary, Mary. And then she didn't, even, she didn't even recognize it. She's just like, where's the body? Mary. And in that moment, she's, she, she looks up and she sees him. And I can't even imagine what that must have been like when he looked at her. It short circuits me, honestly. He must have, his loving eyes must have pierced through her like, I promised. I told you. I promised. I promised I'd be here. And all the peace that she didn't have came. And all the problems that she was carrying, just they went into the shadows. They, they were obliterated in that moment because she was with and in the presence of God. TC, Framingham, Ashland, grab a hold of this by the Spirit. See, there's, there's just nothing more important than encountering Jesus. I'm sorry that it's been about music and preaching and other things. No, there's nothing else more important than being in the presence of Jesus. That can change everything in a moment. Are you with me, everybody? God bless you. TC, I love you. Framingham, I love you. Go right to your worship experience. We're going to sing this song together. I love you. God bless you. Worship team, you can come. Guys, I hope you enjoy this song. I want you to engage fully in this song. I want you to just see yourself rewiring whatever was wrong in your relationship with God. We're going from reason to revelation. 
We're going from the tree of knowledge to the tree of life. We're getting our view right by the Holy Spirit right now. It's more than just a couple minutes in a song. This is something that God